there is something incredibly beautiful about seeing the past, finding a fossil, and being one of the first humans on the planet to hold this piece of history of our planet. But there's a, there's a beauty that lies even deeper because if you know how to look, you can begin to see connections. You can begin to see connections among humans and one another, and among humans and other species, and between humans, other species, and the planet itself. The only reason that is possible is because we share an evolutionary connection with them. Evolution, simply put, is the change of organisms over time, these changes suggest that if we were to go back in time, we'd be able to see that current organisms have some shared common ancestor in the past. The Earth's a dynamic place. I mean, the more we study biology, the more we study paleontology and geology, the more we see that everything on our Earth is capable of changing, and that includes the species on it. I think the terms evolution and Darwinism should be interchanged. Darwinism is sort of a, a leftover term from the 19th century, but evolutionary science has grown enormously in the 150 years since Darwin. So I think it's just better to refer to it as evolutionary science in all of its stripes. Our understanding of evolution has expanded in the most dramatic ways in the last 30 or 40 years, I'd say in two dimensions. One is the mechanisms. Changes happen in creatures because of changes in DNA. Well, that was just outside Darwin's grasp. It wasn't until the 1960s that we cracked the genetic code. It wasn't until the subsequent decades that we could really start looking at different creatures and say, well, they differ here versus there in the genetic code. So really, DNA is a forensic record of evolution. It's where all the blueprints, it's where all the important changes are taking place. The key idea is that genetic material changes through mutation. How mutations occur in an organism has nothing to do with desires or its fitness or its own adaptation. There's no obvious connection between that organism's life and the particular mutation it acquires. Here's the random process. As DNA is replicated in germ cells, making sperm and egg, there are random copying errors that take place, these typos, substitution of a letter, little deletions, et cetera, et cetera. Where those occur in the DNA is essentially at random. So that's the raw material that evolution is working with, and that's random. The non-random part is the sifting and winnowing process, which is, okay, now that you have a population of individuals with all these random mutations distributed throughout, who works better? Who's, who, who just does a little bit better in terms of maybe getting to food, finding a mate, producing offspring, whatever it might be. So that's a non-random process. That depends upon the conditions that an organism is confronted with. That's natural selection. And natural selection works both ways. It works for things that are beneficial and against things that are harmful, not random. The variations themselves have arisen at random. So it's that interplay between random and non-random natural selection that is the evolutionary process. That's the machinery. The second big change in our understanding of evolution is the fossil record. Darwin, when he wrote The Origin of Species, he said, you know, the crust of the earth is a vast museum, you know, that's barely been explored. Well, we've been exploring that crust for the last 150 years and great stuff is coming out of there. You know, when you're a paleontologist, one of the greatest thrills is from time to time, you'll find a species in the fossil record that bridges two great steps in evolution. What this represents is a great transition between fish and land living animal. This is a creature that has fins with limb bones inside. It shows us how this huge transition that if you just look at the endpoints seems so incredibly impossible, happened. It makes the impossible possible. It makes the impossible real. You know, whether it's feathered dinosaurs out of China or, you know, a dozen different hominid species coming out of Africa, you know, we keep finding new things that existed in the past that give us yet a fuller picture of the history of life on Earth. Premium.
important to say that evolutionary biologists don't all agree to what extent evolutionary history is contingent. That is to say, if you were to wind the tape of history back and replay it forward, would you get a very different result or would you get something that's remarkably similar to what we have now? You know, would everything be the same? Would there be a bipedal, hairy, worm-blooded species with big brains walking around? We simply don't know the answer to that. But there's some interesting little data points along the way. One interesting observation is convergence and parallel evolution. That is, we sometimes see similar patterns of evolution in unrelated creatures. The eye is an example of convergence. The structures in eyes that things like uh, squids or octopi have and mammals have are remarkably similar, uh, yet they're derived from very different structures uh, over evolutionary time. So we're converging on a particular solution. I don't think you can see exactly the same creatures emerge because there's a tremendous amount of contingency in history. And you know the easiest way to think about that is, well, you know, a, a pretty good sized asteroid hit the world 66 million years ago. And that really changed the makeup of life on the planet. That said, biologists are struck that similar types of creatures can evolve independently in different parts of the world. It's clear there is contingency in evolution, but to what extent is contingency the order of the day versus convergence? Well, evolutionary biologists are working that out. Understanding our evolutionary history helps us understand who we are today. So evolutionary biology has incredible value for understanding how humans work. So I think the discussion that's really interesting between religious thinkers and scientists is, is, after, is getting over this question of, well, is, you know, did evolution really happen? The more interesting question is, how should we think about the role of humanity and the role of individual lives and our meaning and purpose here in light of evolution, in light of our evolutionary history. And when we look at other critters, we understand much more about ourselves. We understand how our cells work, how our cells divide, how they die. You know, the trick of understanding much of cancer and some of the cell biology of cancers understand, means understanding other creatures. So I like to think that as we discover cures from Alzheimer's to different cancers, that the breakthroughs that will extend and enrich our lives will in some way be based on flies, worms, in some cases even fish. You know, I can't imagine a more powerful or more beautiful statement on the importance of our evolutionary connection to the rest of life on our planet than that.